welcome everyone. So I'm very happy and delighted to be here with all of you this evening to participate to the London Design Festival and to host this discussion on uh, designing for a circular economy. My name is uh, Alice Baudreau. I work at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And our mission is actually to accelerate the transition towards a circular economy. So really good topic. <laughs> Uh, I'm also very lucky to be joined by four panelists this uh, evening, uh, by Sebastian Cox, who is a furniture maker uh, based here in London, and who has a very unique uh, business model because he also uh, manages woodland here in the UK, and we'll learn more about it uh, this evening. We also have Phoebe English, who is a fashion designer and who is challenging the way the fashion industry currently operates by uh, embracing new and circular uh, practices in her design work under her own label, Phoebe English. We are joined by John Oswald, who is uh, the managing director at uh, Accenture Song uh, and who is leading the sustainability studio. And again, Accenture, I'm sure everybody here in this room uh, knows about them. And uh, we're also joined by Marcus Engman, who is the Chief Creative Officer at uh, Inca Retail, which actually is better known by all of us as IKEA, and who is also uh, running a creative collective uh, called uh, Skewds. Great. <laughs> so now that the presentation are done, uh, just to kind of introduce the topic of our discussion today, we are going to talk about uh, circular and regenerative design. I'm not going to spend much time to talk about why are these two new ways of uh, uh, practicing design emerging. I think we are all by now very much aware of the challenges uh, we are facing as organizations, society, and as individuals, and especially the climate and planetary challenges we are facing. What I want to focus on uh, this evening is very much this kind of global momentum behind uh, pushing for and creating and working towards a regenerative future, which to me, but we'll discuss about this uh, this evening, means a future where people and uh, planet can thrive together and where uh, the human activities actually replenish uh, the nature and the world around us rather than extract from it, which is the way that, uh, unfortunately, the world uh, currently runs. And when we talk about this topic, I think we need to kind of start by uh, talking about this very unique and elemental inspiration that is nature. So my first question to each uh, of you, and maybe we can start with uh, you, Sam, is what uh, role does nature play in your life and especially in your design practice? Um, thank you. Um, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so nature is kind of, uh, well, it's this big sort of concept, isn't it, as often treated as something else. But for me, it's completely integral. I am part of nature. My business is part of nature. That's kind of how I view it. Um, as you said in the introduction, we design and make furniture, but we also manage woodlands. Um, and actually, in some ways, the furniture is a byproduct of the woodland management. So our, uh, or my personal interest is in uh, biodiversity recovery within woodlands. And part of allowing biodiversity to recover within woodlands uh, is managing them, managing the woodlands. So when we manage woodlands, we fell trees. That lets light into the woodland floor. That stimulates more biodiversity. And that is a sort of cycle that accidentally mimics mega herbivores, like woolly mammoths, which were here long before we were. And so we're sort of accidentally tapping into this extremely regenerative process. Uh, and the byproduct of that is that we have wood, which we can work with. It's not perfect wood. It's not kind of always um, immaculate forestry product. But using design and craft, we can take that byproduct and add value to it and um, tell the story of why woodland managements are important along the way. So for me, nature is like not something that I sort of look at or visit or kind of conceptualize about. It is implicit in everything we do, and I see myself as part of the systems of nature. Great. Phoebe, if you have a view on, on nature and the way it, the role it plays in your design process as well. Yes. Um, is, is it working? Can you hear me? I've got a really quiet voice, so I hope it is working. Um, so I suppose the role, nature, the role that nature plays in, in our practice is, um, is one where we've, where we've kind of identified that we're vastly removed from nature, um, almost you know, divorced from nature um, in terms of 
uh, living in an urban environment, um, having the studio based in an urban environment, um, you know, being removed from producers of fabric and things like that, and just sort of having a complete disconnect. So our involvement with nature is, is, a, is a, a, a kind of an aim to, to get closer to it and, and to embed it very, very solidly in all of our design decisions um, in the studio. So it's, I guess it's a sort of a destination we're trying to get to. Um, and that is through our partners, so through our producers and our suppliers. Um, fashion has this very long international weaving spider web um, of producers across the world. And it's very hard to get back to the soil that your raw material might have originated at. Even when you have the best intentions, it's very, very hard to do that. Um, so we've been trying to look at alternative ways to be working with people who are having positive, uh, positive impact on soil health, water health, um, biodiversity, um, all those things, um, just through our design decisions. You know, how can we, as an urban-based business, positively affect um, nature? that sort of huge umbrella of, of what, you know, of, of nature. And that's definitely about sort of identifying regional places that we can be working. So looking within the vicinity of London and greater London itself. Thanks. John? I've been thinking about this one. Many, many years ago, I started taking photographs of lichen. Just because it's so beautiful. Like when you get it really close, it's like little microcosms of the world itself. It's gorgeous. So I've been taking photos of lichen for years, and um, I have a Pinterest board of lichen photos. It's really good. A super fan. Uh, yeah. And, um, but it's only recently I've discovered the true significance of the whole thing, as I've discovered more about what lichen really are. Because it's, it's not a species as such, it's a, it's a collaboration. It's where fungi and algae come together and do something new. Like make soil out of rock. It's incredible, actually. And the role of nature in my practice, as it were. So I work in a 710,000 person company. With a presence, you know, you name it. We're here in a partnership with a company of about 105,000 people, SAP. And how do you make sense of nature in that context? Well, I often use it as a metaphor for how we work, actually. Um, and it's a little bit of a reflection on the role of design, actually, because lichen, algae and fungi collaborating to make something different and surviving differently. It's a bit like design working with different parts of an organization. It's a bit like how an organization functions. So I use a lot of nature-based metaphors at work. I think I drive everybody crazy, to be honest. But I'll say things like, you know, our, our company's not very big at all. It's just a huge mycorrhizal network. And you've just got to find the right nodes to connect with. And then people look at me and say, uh, sure. <laughs> but it helps me. <laughs> anyway, but I just find it a very helpful way of thinking about the world. And in closing, um, like can kind of show that nature is not about competition. It's often about collaboration and doing something creative together. Lycan have shown us that. We've understood that over the years. I find that quite exciting. Marcus? I don't know what to say after all of those wise words. <laughs> uh, I mean, in nature, what is nature to someone from Sweden? Uh, Sweden is almost as big as, as uh, France. And it only has like 10 million people living there. So nature is a little bit in your face when you're there. Uh, and it's been a big part. And how you look upon it, maybe, as a typical Swedish way of looking upon nature is to see it as your, it's, it's how you fill your pantry. And that was how I was brought up, actually. You go out in nature and you harvest things. And I think that's the thing also. How could you harvest things in, in a good way from out of nature and actually being regenerative with nature in that sense? That's something that you learn from an early age, and I think that's natural to turn it into a design practice as well, and that's what we do. 
Great. I want to pick up on what John was mentioning around collaboration, because it's a world we throw more and more around, and we, you know, mention more and more. And for sure, if you want to change the system we live in and we operate uh, within, you have to change and collaborate with people within your company, people outside your company, and so on. And so I just want to understand what collaboration, again, means to you, and how do you maybe experiment new ways of collaborating, or find new people to collaborate with, to implement those changes who wants to start on this one? Yeah? So new ways to collaborate and how I think about collaboration. It's not easy because we're people and people are complicated. And it's sometimes quite tricky to bring a new team together and do something different. But it's something I think we've gotten better at this past at least 10 years because we're a lot more conscious of what different people bring to something. And we found better ways of understanding each other and finding each other's patterns, almost writing our own little user manuals for, for each other. So in, in, in my line of work, where you're bringing together new teams all the time who haven't necessarily worked together, you have, to, you have to work consciously quite hard at that. But taking another big step, so I'm relatively new to the field of sustainability. Full disclosure, I stand on the shoulders of giants here. Um, but what I have noticed about what it's done to, to business is that we're not, it's not a zero-sum game anymore, which I find immensely reassuring and gives me a huge amount of hope. We're not trying to grab for the same thing, or we're not trying to own a piece of IP or something. When you're working in sustainability to get to, to, get to sustainable outcomes for, or even regenerative outcomes, you, you have to work differently. And so, I've just recently rejoined Accenture after a period away doing other things. And I, f I find a company which is actually really good at working fairly seamlessly. It's not always easy, but it's way easier than it used to be. And I think it's a bit of a paradigm that we're seeing in many places at the moment, bigger companies anyway. That makes sense? It does. I do want to challenge that a little bit because I found that in our role with the foundation, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we do see that collaboration within the company seems to uh, yeah, grow more and more and be more and more seamless and people are getting to use to work you know, between engineers, procurement teams, designers and so on. But I found that the collaboration uh, outside those walls of the companies, and maybe this is where entrepreneurs like uh, Phoebe and you, Sebastian, can help us as well, uh, get inspired is actually not that easy. There's a lot of good intention, but to actually put it into action, it's, uh, it seems to be much more difficult. So I don't know if you have some kind of stories or anecdotes or tips to better collaborate outside of the walls of your organization. Yeah, I mean, you can't win at sustainability. <laughs> uh, you can only collaborate and, and be a movement together. Um, and I think, yeah, there is that mentality shift for sure I've definitely felt that that you know people understand and, and recognize that working in a different way isn't necessarily about having a USP that you own as a company people deeply understand that it's part of a larger thing and a very important larger thing um, so yeah I mean we do a lot of collaborating so we're very small um, and it's really key. Um, we collaborate, I would say at the most significant collaborations we do is, is, is through education. Um, so I guess in the studio we believe that um, this, this practice, this way of working, or these ideas around ways of working aren't something we can own as a company. And because we're so small, they're only ever gonna go so far, but the message behind them has, has great value. Ooh. Hello? <laughs> um, I don't know if you can still hear me. Um, has greater value than the product we're actually making. So for us, collaborating with that message is, is more valuable than the, the clothes that we're, we're, we're actually producing. Um, and, our, and our belief is that these ideas and these solutions and these trials and researchers um, should belong to everyone. And, specifically to a younger generation of design talent that's coming up. So embedding those practices and, and ideas into general design practice 
um, is something that we we are we feel is very important to collaborate with external teams and specifically educational um, bodies getting that within syllabuses and not just sort of a sustainability project here and a recycling project there, but actually having that embedded within all design ethos and practice. So that's, that would be our, I guess, our, I, what I feel is our most important collaborations. I really like this vision, the, the angle of education and bringing those kind of practices to the, the wider audience and the, the wider designer community and not just kind of uh, um, focusing on a specific kind of audience or, or small group of, uh, of practitioners. I don't know if Seb or Marcus, you want to add to that? But I think it's, uh, if you want to have good collaborations, it's built upon generosity and curiosity, like for sure, no matter what you do. And uh, what you're saying, it's, it's very much about sharing things. If you look upon when we came about like ways of working better with the circularity, for instance, we had like tools and uh, design tools for product development. Uh, then we decided to make them open source, which is a way of actually making people, you know, make use of what gigantic companies like IKEA could afford to develop, working for the greater good, not just for, you know, uh, selling more items. And I think that's, that's a, a big thing. Another thing when it's more like curiosity-led is to go to places where you don't really know where you're going to end up. <laughs> I think that's always important too. So here in London, we have done a thing which I think is, uh, is it's been really, really fun and we're still learning a lot. We call it Atelier 100. It's like a joint venture together with H&M where we're taking on like the young creatives and producers within 100 kilometers around London actually and make, made a program for them just to educate them and, and also share what we have in terms of, of uh, learnings in the two big companies. So ways of working with both circularity, but also like efficiency in design and so on, and how you could make your things fly in a better way. And, and that's been, I think, really good for them, but really good for us also because we get new learnings and we also get like a relationship with the next generation of creatives, which is important. So always being on the way and be curious for the next thing. I think that's important. That's why you collaborate too. I think the final collaboration that will be worth mentioning there is the collaboration with nature as well itself. Um, I was sort of, as you were kind of, everything that you're describing resonates with me, but at the same time, I also feel like in my business, in my practice, because of the scale at which we're working, I've almost been withdrawing from the existing relationships in the setup of the way that timber is traded internationally, manufactured over, overseas, <clears throat> overseas and retailed around the world. And I've been trying to sort of try and break down how that system might apply to myself, bring that sort of vertical integration into my own business. And so in many ways, I've been a bit of a grumpy old man, kind of in that sort of wanting to learn the essence of each of those stages of the process of how something goes from a resource to a retail environment. So along the way, I've kind of um, been resisting collaboration at points, but always mindful that my main collaboration is with natural systems and how I can learn and share there as well. So everything resonates, but there's always this part of me which is like, I think also self-reflection and making sure that we stay focused on keeping Mother Nature as a stakeholder in what's happening too. One thing that several of you have mentioned, which I really like, is the local and regional aspect of your work, because several of you have mentioned this already. And uh, oftentimes, when we try to kind of change the way we work, uh, it feels a bit of a daunting task as well, and we don't know where to start, especially if we are talking about bigger organization again. Um, I wonder how important this kind of local, regional kind of uh, encourage is for you, and how you, you balance that between finding this kind of regional, local approach, but being able to kind of scale up and, and have a potentially a, a global impact as well, or thinking about having a global impact. Who wants to take uh, that one? Phoebe, I can see you raised your... <laughs> um, yeah, well, we're very small, as I said, but I think for us, the question of scalability, yeah, I guess it's it's almost like a mystery to me, this, this scalability question. Um, is almost kind of not relevant to what what I do. Um, and I think when I think about scalability, I think about repli replicating um, rather than scaling. Um, so for example, with 
with what you're doing? You know, what if there was one of you in every region in the UK um, being a really wonderful husband to forests and um, to biodiversity? And if those systems were replicated rather than scaled, um, I think from, for us, that's something that we're much more, feel much more closer to in terms of um, making things bigger. <laughs> I think for me, as I kind of alluded to in my last answer, it's, I don't, um, I'm, I'm not like, so we work with British wood, that's like our thing, but I'm not standing there waving a union jack, kind of being all Brexity about it. I'm, I'm, I suppose that's just my way of trying to understand an incredibly complicated picture, which is globalization. And I don't reject it. I see value in it. I see value in those systems. I embrace global connectivity. I have friends on the other side of the world, and I love that. I love travel. But it's just like if you are, as one person, trying to understand the interconnected systems, actually thinking locally is the best way to begin on that journey. And, you know, I'm, I've been in business 10 years. I'm still loads to learn um, because actually... I think we do need to question our massive global system, which, um, you know, has inherent problems. Like I've just done another talk about ash dieback, which is a disease, which is a pathogen, which has been brought here by our internationally traded system. And, it's, you know, th there are inherent problems along the way. Obviously, it brings prosperity and wealth around the world, which is obviously a bonus. But I think sometimes stepping back from that, thinking about what's happening on, in our backyard, studying that and then applying those ideas at scale, as Phoebe alludes to, could be other ways of really, you know, exploring the problem. Yeah, I really like this vision and this replicability kind of angle rather than scalability, which um, is an unfortunate buzzword these days as well. Um, we started to talk about nature at the beginning, and I just wanted to kind of um, contradict that with oftentimes still today, we talk about nature now more and more as an inspiration, and it seems to still be opposed to technology. While we are living in a very technological world, and I don't think this is going to go away as well. So I was wondering if you had some kind of um, position or, or ideas or kind of vision around what role technology plays in uh, bringing this uh, more natural world or natural co collection uh, today. Maybe, John, you can uh, start us on that. That's it's not a small question. Um, there's a lot in this. Uh, when you start thinking about, well, technology and scale tend to, tend to go together. And personally, I've always struggled with the concept of scaling something. I never really understood what it, what it meant. I've seen it more recently in that if you, if you build something and it works, then it's going to work in quite a few places. If it works in a few places, it might work in hundreds of places. And before you know it, you've got software which is embedded and everywhere. With that comes extreme responsibility. So we've got to take care about what we encode, is what I'm trying to get at, I think. And you see, it's a really difficult, big question, this one. Technology operates at several levels. Right. When, when you start getting into questions of regeneration and sustainability, technology plays a role because technology emits greenhouse gases. It just does. Um, servers, lines of code, and so on. So on one level, you've just got to get that right and, and just try and be a bit more frugal about how you code, which is not something we've been very good at over the last 20 years, by the way. We've, everything's proliferated, and we need to start scaling that back a bit and being a bit more... Frugal, I keep using that word. The, ne the next thing about technology is that it's a, it's a way of modeling. And often, organiz lar larger organizations will tend to operate based on the software they've got. It should really be the other way around, but it tends, it tends to happen. You implement a package of software, it makes you think a certain way. So therefore, as technologists, you've got a massive opportunity to launch a slightly different way of doing your operations. Example. If you were able to look at extended, extended producer responsibility and build that into a system, then you would start to understand where your plastic comes from and maybe find alternatives to plastic and understand your legal exposure. And because that software is available, you start using it. So therefore, regeneration, sustainability becomes a bit more normalized. 
The next level of technology is, is how you model things. Almost use technology as a whiteboard. And here I'm going to get a bit metaverse -y. But if, you're, if you are able to model, a, a, as it were, a digital twin of a production process, then you can change something without having to commit vast amounts of expenditure and waste on, on doing something that didn't work anyway. This happens quite a lot in fashion as well, by the way. Um, that's a very long answer to your question, but... No, I think it's also a very good one. I just want to take the opportunity because I think we have some time to take a couple of questions from the audience. So I don't know if uh, I can see raised hands. I think there are some microphones. There's somebody in white over there. Is there uh, some kind of vision of how, what would be kind of the next step after the circular economy? Because right now, uh, just staying on the topic of regenerative technology, with, which this week has been about, uh, is there any kind of an idea of what might happen to the economy and trade when more people have access to regenerative technologies and might essentially be able to produce their own materials and objects from home? So is there any kind of thinking that is done about what would be the next step and how to facilitate it? I have an answer if you, yeah, oh, if you want to. <laughs> Um, I mean, at least at the foundation, we work a lot with Kate Rowers from the Donut uh, uh, Economy, if you know that name. If you don't, I would really encourage to look at her work, because I think Sorry, the circular it? economy is really a mindset and a framework to go somewhere, but we have to collectively design what this somewhere looks like, right? Uh, I think a regenerative future is a good way also of, of uh, kind of uh, conceptualize what this uh, future looks like. but. If you really want to get like, the economical kind of angle, um, the donut, donut economy really explains how we can uh, hopefully combine, uh, again, uh, a thriving people, population, society, people who are really uh, fulfilling their uh, basic human rights with a very, very uh, thriving planet and uh, an economy which works within the planetary boundaries. Because I think this is what we want to achieve, right? People thriving and planet thriving together. And the circular economy is a way to uh, achieve that, and circular and regenerative design is a way to kind of uh, uh, reimagine that, that world. But I'm happy for you guys to complete. Uh, <laughs> if I may add to that, I think that circular economy is, is going to change the goods flow all around the world, actually. That's what is, what's going to happen, and it's just started out. And it's going to be a completely new view upon what is raw material for the future. Well, maybe now we've, we source raw material from different parts of the world, and then we ship it. Now, places like this, London, will sit on a lot of raw material because it's actually going to be waste that is our number one raw material to be able to make uh, sustainable and affordable products for the future. Otherwise, we will lose out on affordability. And we know that affordability is like the number one threshold for making people buy great design. So that's the only way to achieve it. Then I think we're only we're, we're just talking about like raw materials and materials when we talk about circularity. But it's also how you design from bottom up. I could see that it would be interesting actually to look upon a far more component-based uh, designed world for the future. Because if you think in components, you could actually reuse the components without grinding them down or using energy to you know, reuse them. And that's like the next level of design thinking, I would say, on how we take it on. And doing that and still doing beautiful and interesting products without them looking like something like a Meccano piece or something. That was, that's a hard one, I could tell you. Yeah, I guess um, thinking about waste, we, yeah, we did um, a collection in February 2020 just um, from regional waste. So from the challenge was, you know, could we make a whole collection from other people's waste materials and the subsequent production from that collection? So it's a sort of challenge. Um, and yeah, the idea was to collect the, the, the waste from as small a distance as possible around the vicinity of the studio. Um, so I guess beyond that, the, uh, the idea, and we've carried that on since that trial, we now don't use any virgin materials because there is so much waste. Um, we're talking about lots of different grades of textile waste, so small offcuts that would go straight into 
the bin, leftovers, faulty rolls, over-ordered quantities, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of over-ordered material that doesn't have a purpose. Um, so lots of different grades, but ideally what would happen would be that I couldn't work like that anymore because there wouldn't be any waste. So that would be for us the ideal situation where, you know, we'd have to find a different way of working. Um, so, yeah. We have a lot of unlearning to do. We've, if you think about the scale question, there's a lot of people showing the way as, as how, how things could be. But there's a lot of very, very big companies who are, have spent decades, sometimes even up to a century, optimizing a process so that it works as efficiently, quote unquote, as, as possible. And that's embedded in a lot of organizational understanding in systems, in processes, in software. And it's going to take quite a lot of, as I say, unlearning and almost recoding how the organization works. To, to get there, because it's all very well talking about how you change the supply chain, but there's a big ripple effect through lots of organizations before you can, you're actually going to get there. So you, you guys are well on the way. Um, even then, it's probably not perfect. Pretty um, far from perfect, but we're yeah. on our way. Yeah. And as I guess this is what I mean about software. If, you, if you've got more um, understanding about what alternatives could be embedded in a, a process, people are more likely to follow it. I guess. That also plays to that point about scale as well. Um, if you, you just, there's lots to, there's lots to unlearn in our system generally. Um, I can't, I can't get past this idea of just, there's, there's loads of people doing incredibly powerful, impactful things and showing the way. And, and there's an awful lot of big companies that have got a lot of catching up to do, it seems to me. Uh, I would just like to ask Marcos if you can hear. If you can just talk more about uh, open source design, open source as a tool for environmental sustainability and social sustainability, with your experience in IKEA. Okay. No, I think it's, uh, you know, <clears throat> this has been uh, the, uh, at, at the core of IKEA since the very start, I would say that if you have a good idea, try to share it to as many as possible. And I think we talked about scale, and, and it, it feels strange to me to sit here and not being part of the scale discussion, because I'm, I'm representing quite a big scale. <laughs> and and uh, for, for us, it's like, of course, an opportunity, but also a gigantic responsibility to have like one billion customers a year. Uh, and it's more designing, if you, if you think of how to work with open source, it's not just how you design your products, it's actually how you design for behavioral change through products. And that's where we could make like the biggest change. It's not inside of the company, how we are resource efficient and so on. That's super good to take care of all of those 200,000 employees that we have and make that work better. But the biggest challenge and the biggest possibility that we have is actually to work for the one billion customers that we have to make them behave in new, more sustainable ways. Uh, and there we have like ideas, if you see that when we did like a completely revamp of how to make like a LED lamp, for instance, when LED lamps were costing like 15 euros each, we redesigned the LED lamp to be something that was actually a one euro piece. And that changed our energy consumption in a lot of parts of the world by just doing that. So those things I think is important. So for me, it's not about IP or anything. It's more like if you find tool sets, if you find like uh, ways of working, share them with as many as possible. Uh, so because that's how we change behaviors of people. So beyond products, I would say. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I don't know if uh, we can see raised hands again. Hi. Um, one of my questions was specifically around, I guess, when it comes to innovation and designing, a lot of it can be quite disruptive um, internally in, in organizations. And um, I've seen some really, really great concepts, some really great business um, models and new circular business models. But for me, the, the kind of part from having this really great idea to making it scale is how you get that internal buy-in and that internal business case. And I'd just be keen to hear um, from the panel how you've kind of overcome that challenge, because especially for new 
organizations that are still immature in this circular journey, I think that's almost that biggest leap is how do you get that internal buy-in? Also starts. <laughs> oh, well, I, I mean, I, my internal buying would be with myself, so uh, that's quite easy. Um, without trying to not answer the question, I guess the next thing is then how do I sell that and ex effectively create external buy-in in my own concept to therefore allow that to become a business. And this is something which, um, you know, is, a, is a, a, like the largest part of my job is actually educating audiences and my customers in terms of, you know, why what I'm, you know, what I'm saying and the message that I bring in terms of the things that I'm doing. And I think actually that's, you know, when I look at what I'm doing and I compare it to the impact that Marcus can have, you know, I feel really insignificant. But there's that sort of constant push-pull relationship, I think, between different scales of businesses in terms of being able to say, you know, here are ideas, uh, scrutinizing ways of doing things, and then actually... It doesn't, it's not necessarily down to me to scale those ideas. It's then can be down to other companies and organizations in that sort of collaborative sense to kind of take those on board. Um, so yeah, I, I, my, my, my most important buy-in is actually probably with the audiences which I try to create via technology, social media, et cetera, et cetera. A little bit of advice, I suppose. Um, this hopefully resonates with you. I often find working with designers, um, the because I've been doing it for years. Um, in another life, I, I did something called business design, which I'll talk about with anybody over wine. So design is wonderful at creating empathy with the people who are going to use a product in the first place. And that's where the good ideas come from. That's where you get your interesting business models and stuff. Where I think designers could improve a bit is, is often empathy with their own organizations. Um, because there's a lot of people between you and getting a product out into the market and making a difference. And you've got to understand, understand almost the internal people as much in the same way as you would an end user, actually, and, and start to figure out ways to empathize. Because that's going to get you the, the idea somewhere a bit, more, a bit more quickly. And that involves dealing with a lot of different mindsets that are very, very different to design mindset as well. And that can be very demoralizing if you're a designer. But it's the raw material. It's the thing you've got to work with. So empathy with end users, empathy with the business you're in as well. May I add something to that also? Super, really good. I think that one of the things that is good is to find a common language around design inside of the company. Uh, and that's hard, but that's actually the thing that moves a company the most. So how you look upon and how you talk about, this, uh, talk about design, no matter if you're an engineer, if you're the actual designer, if you're a product developer, or you're kind of maybe the business leader for that part of the business, uh, to review and talk about it from the same angles. And that, we developed something we call democratic design within IKEA that we're, uh, you know, we think that's pretty good, at least for us, which has like five cornerstones. And then everybody looks upon a product from those five cornerstones and, and measure it and talk about it from that. And it makes it so much better because it's less subjective, actually. Uh, and uh, it makes also everybody ships into it. And nobody owns the design. It's not the ownership of the designer, the design. It's a team effort to do design at a big company like IKEA. So I think that's an important part. The other part that I would like to share is actually stop the whispering game. Uh, this thing about not sharing from the very beginning what you're doing just makes it harder. And also, I hate it when I do like things, when you invent things, and then you're working on it. And then some, some person at the marketing department make their own freaking interpretation of my idea. Uh, why weren't you part of it from the very beginning instead? And you know, so it's communication and design should work like together from the very beginning. Do we have time for uh, one last question, maybe? Uh, mine is not a question, but a comment going back to um, the concept that nature is not about uh, competition, but collaboration. It's the same as a consumer. If I'm buying furniture, if I'm designing my home, I will have some pieces that are from Ikea, and I will have some pieces that are made specially for a certain thing, and it's the same with fashion. So again, as a consumer, 
you have to also think about why you're buying something and why you're buying that particular thing. And I think it is important to educate people about their choices and find out, well, where are they sourcing the things around themselves, whether it's their clothes, furniture, or you know, software <laughs> that they're using. So basically, it was just a comment. Thanks. I think we have to actually close on that. So thank you very much to uh, all of you for joining us uh, this evening. I could keep discussing with you guys quite a long time because I think common language is a clearly a, a key topic. Uh, I think even beyond design, when you talk about circular economy, regenerative topics, it's also new vocabulary that we need to educate people about. Metrics, how do you measure these changes as well, is a really key topic. So we could open more and more discussion. Uh, so maybe next time, next year. Um, thank you very much to uh, the four of you for joining us uh, this evening and for your time and your insights. Uh, thank you very much for all of you who have uh, attended uh, the lecture and uh, come uh, and join us here at the v &A. For all of you in the room, uh, you can join us downstairs. I think there will be drinks, so let's uh, uh, meet uh, each other uh, around a glass of, uh, of wine or something. And uh, thank you very much and have a great evening.